the plasma ion engine does shoot out a tremendous blast of ions, and some people have thought about using the plasma engine to go to Mars. I'm Ben, and this is Bob from Mad Science of Minnesota. We're here today with Dr. Michio Kaku, author of Physics of the Future, the latest in a string of amazing physics books that he's put out. And we're here today to talk to him about what life might be like 100 years or so from now, and also to get his view on some general science things. We'll try very hard to stump him. So, Bob, if you want to take the first question. Okay. Well, I'm uh, a chemist, so I'm interested in uh, the battery it is one of the weak points in the mobile electrical systems that exist today, and whether it's cell phones, um, computers, or automobiles. And I'd heard that there was a Iron 7 form that was being uh, worked with as a potential battery. And I was wondering where things stand in this area. Well, you are exactly right. It turns out that the lack of a battery is one of the reasons why we don't have a portable jet pack. We don't have our flying cars uh, and why we really don't have that many electric cars on the road. Over 100 years ago, Edison and Henry Ford were good friends and they had a friendly bet. What power source would drive automobiles of the future? Edison thought it would be batteries. Henry Ford said, no, it's going to be gasoline. Well, let's be blunt about this. Pound for pound, kilogram for kilogram, gasoline has more joules of energy than a car battery. Remember that gasoline is concentrated sunlight. Sunlight, in some sense, concentrated since the time of the dinosaurs. So gasoline is really power packed, while batteries are still lacking. Now, in terms of the next generation, Many physicists are looking at nano batteries using nanotechnology, which can store enormous amounts of energy. Think of a substance called graphene. Graphene is one layer thick of carbon atoms. It is so strong. It is the strongest material known to science. If I take an elephant, put an elephant on a pencil and balance the pencil on a little bit of graphene, graphene will not tear and will actually hold up the elephant. Now, if I start to stack, if I start to stack layer upon layer of graphene, then I can begin to create a nano battery or a nano capacitor, tremendous amounts of energy stored in one place. And so that's where we might be able to make a leap forward because a portable power pack is the problem. Think of a jet pack. You realize that the Nazis during World War II helped to perfect the jet pack so that Nazi soldiers can go across rivers that have bridges that were blown out by the Allies. The problem is the jetpack only operates with hydrogen peroxide for just a few minutes. And then you're left hanging in the air with no energy whatsoever. So yes, batteries are the main weak link in this chain. And we hope that bat nano batteries may pick up the slack, but again, it may take a few decades to perfect that. Mm -hmm. Well, I've heard that we could use insects as a way of attacking enemies in wars. Uh, how would we go about training these insects to do what we want done? Well, it turns out that there's something called optogenetics. Uh, that is, it's possible to breed fruit flies and different kinds of insects such that neural pathways, individual neural pathways light up like a Christmas tree. And as a consequence, it's possible to stimulate certain very simple neural pathways like the escape mechanism. So believe it or not, it's possible to build a laser, shine it on an insect like a fruit fly, and it will automatically take off on cue. Now, when the story of optogenetics hit the press, you can imagine that comics had a field day. In fact, on the Jay Leno show, Jay Leno, imagine that you push a button and then a fly goes into George Bush's mouth. <laughs> well, believe it or not, the military has looked into this, but we are a long ways to go before we can get smart flies and smart bugs to do our bidding. 
we're only talking about some very simple neural pathways, mm -hmm. pathways of eating, pathways of escape, but more complicated organisms like dogs or cats, it'd be extremely difficult, even using optogenetics, to trace the neural pathways of specific kinds of behaviors. So this is still in its infancy, so don't think that we're gonna be able to train gigantic waves of bees anytime soon. Yeah, uh, killer bees would be a lot better than fruit flies. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, rail guns? Uh, 20, 25 years ago, there was quite a bit of interest in rail guns, and I saw this as having a potential of shooting extremely rapid projectiles. Is this work still continuing? Yes, but on a much lower level. You are absolutely correct in Popular Mechanics magazines and other Popular magazines. About 20 years ago, it was quite a sensation being able to launch from rest a projectile that would go into orbit. Forget about booster rockets. Forget about Cape Kennedy. Forget about all these gigantic rockets. You would have a portable device you could put in a living room and from your living room, shoot a projectile at 18,000 miles per hour and have it go into orbit around the Earth. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is the payload would be flattened because of the impact on the air. Air friction, believe it or not, air hitting the projectile at 18,000 miles an hour is enough to flatten steel. As a consequence, the military has looked into this as a form of Star Wars in outer space. In outer space, there is no air friction, and some people have thought about creating what are called smart nails. That is getting a rail gun that shoots nails at the enemy satellite or the enemy bomb, wiping it out with a rail gun. So once again, rail guns exist. High school kids play with them. You can see science fair projects at high schools where people build miniature rail guns. The problem is, among other things, air friction, which flattens the payload, so you have to go into outer space. And at that point, some people are thinking that maybe even nails or pellets would be enough to wipe out enemy satellites or enemy rockets. So that's the reason why uh, research in rail guns didn't take off so much, but that's why research in cruise missiles did take off. Cruise missiles travel very slowly, some of them subsonic, in fact, below the speed of sound. But because they're intelligent, they can see the terrain and drop a bomb right between the goalposts of a football field from a distance of 500 miles. So the cruise missile became the weapon of choice rather than the rail gun. Do you see rail guns, um, if they were put in space, as a viable way of launching long distance satellites or someday perhaps even space capsules to explore farther and faster than conventional rocket fuel can take us? Well, in principle, however, you have a problem, and that is uh, Newton's third law of motion for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. On Earth, if I get a shotgun and I fire the shotgun, the shotgun drives back on your shoulder and will actually give you recoil. So there are gonna be recoils of these things in outer space. Now NASA has looked at a different kind of projectile and that is the plasma ion engine. Ion engines are not very spectacular. They're like the tortoise compared to the hare. However, if the hare is a booster rocket, it only lasts four, maybe four or five minutes and then kaput. It's like the hair, it runs out of steam. The tortoise is the ion engine, releasing a steady stream of ions for years at a time. It's not spectacular. You put an ion engine on the tabletop and it does nothing. In outer space, it does pick up energy over several years. However, the plasma ion engine does shoot out a tremendous blast of ions. And some people have thought about using the plasma engine to go to Mars. It can actually cut down the flight time to go to Mars for maybe a year down to maybe three months. And that could save time because in outer space, our astronauts would be hit with lots of radiation in outer space. In fact, just going across from New York City to Los Angeles, you get a dental X-ray of radiation, a few millirems per hour, every time you fly from New York City to Los Angeles. 
And so that's why we want to cut down the time it takes to go from Earth to Mars. You talked about Moore's Law in your book. Uh, is it starting to disappear? Will it be replaced by something else? Yes, Moore's Law says the computer power doubles a every 18 months. And you can set your watch by it. It's a mathematical formula when you plot it on a curve. Because of Moore's Law, when you get a greeting card in the mail that sings happy birthday to you, there's a chip in that card with more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. Hitler, Eisenhower, Churchill would have killed to get that chip. And what do you do with it? You throw it away in the garbage. But all things must pass. Eventually, the heat generated by a transistor becomes so much, and you get leakage because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You don't know where the electron is anymore because the transistor is maybe five atoms across. Your Pentium chip today has a layer about 20 atoms across at the minimum. But in 10 years' time, it'll be five atoms across. At that point, the electron can leak out and Moore's law collapses. In fact, I spoke in Switzerland and met the physicists at IBM Geneva, I mean, IBM Zurich, and they told me that they can already see it. It's already happening. Just last week at the New York Times, it was announced that Intel is thinking about going into the third dimension. Instead of making chips that are flat, making chips that are stacked and three-dimensional because they're bumping up now against the end of Moore's Law. Silicon Valley could become a rust belt because would you buy an upgrade? Would you buy a new computer game knowing that it's exactly the same in terms of power as last year's model? Maybe not. And that could cut off and start a recession in the computer business unless we physicists find a replacement for silicon. Along that same lines, um uh, I think maybe in the, even in the same chapter of the book, you talk about miniaturizing transistors and computer chips to the point where you could, in theory, have a computing device so small that you could put it on a contact lens that could then, you could see through it and it could interact with what was around in the world. It could tell you uh, when you run into somebody you met at a conference who that person was based on facial recognition. Um, That's right. Internet contact lenses are great because at a cocktail party, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party because your contact lens will identify them. And if they speak Chinese to you, translate from Chinese into English, putting out subtitles below them. And who will be the first to line up to buy these Internet contact lenses? College students taking final examinations. They will blink and see all the answers, all the amino acids, all the sines and cosines inside their contact lens. And the next people to buy internet contact lenses will be artists. Artists and architects will wave their hand and beautiful works of art will emerge because the internet contact lens can take the motions of their fingers and create three-dimensional plastic representations of what they create. Tourists will love this because tourists will be able to resurrect the entire Roman Empire as they walk through the ruins of Rome. And guess what? The military is putting millions of dollars to perfect this technology. I took a film crew down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and we filmed it. You take a helmet of an ordinary GI and there's a small eyepiece. You flick it over the person's eye, and immediately the soldier sees the internet of the battlefield. Enemy forces, friendly forces, artillery, jet airplanes, everything laid out right next to your eyeball. I tell you, man, this is big. This is going to change everything as we move to augmented reality.